Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Always a pleasure to be a part of these courses. Always uh, able to learn as well as uh, participate is really such an honor. So thank you. Um, so yeah, with focusing on lordosis of the cervical spine, um, you know, we don't think as often about cervical deformity, maybe as much as uh, thoracolumbar deformity because it's less common. Um, but in the patients that are affected by it, obviously it's very important and uh, important to get it right. So uh, these are some of the uh, things that I think are uh, have been helpful in my practice in terms of examining the cervical spine, um, you know, measurements, looking at uh, what is appropriate to do. And um, let me see if I can control here. Not advancing. There we go. Um, so, um, you know, looking at cervical alignment, you know, um, can often be overlooked. Uh, many of us do ACDF and feel that maybe it's not the big, most important um, aspect of that procedure. Um, you know, people do have a lot of uh, mechanisms to compensate, whether it's through the rest of the spine um, or, you know, through the vertebrae above and below. So although we may be finding some malalignment of the cervical spine, it's not always something that patients may complain about uh, regularly. Um, this is a patient that came to me um, having had a previous ACDF about four or five years ago, um, having some trouble with adjacent segment disease. And, uh, you know, the surgeon who did this may say that it was a perfectly done surgery. He did well for, you know, a few years. But are we creating problems by ignoring cervical lordosis? Um, you know, even if it's a shorter segment fusion, um, I think we can, you know, even through just through more attention to alignment, uh, avoid some adjacent segment pathology. Um, so when looking at the cervical spine, you know, really what is important? Um, there's so many different parameters that have been described in the literature, and, you know, I think some of them can be more or less useful than others. Um, and, you know, how much time, how much, uh, you know, fluency do you have measuring radiographs in the clinic to make it really applicable to your practice or when you're doing your preoperative assessment? Um, so these are looking at, you know, Cobb, Jackson, and Harrison angles, you know, which one of these do you actually want to use? Obviously, Cobb angle is something that's important. Um, this is the K-line tilt, um, you know, described in laminoplasty, what's ap appropriate or inappropriate for laminoplasty. Um, you know, this is our C2 to 7 SVA. Um, another measure is our um, T1 slope, the thoracic inlet angle, and the neck tilt. You know, all kind of interchangeable, giving us an idea of separate things, but, you know, which ones of these are actually useful? Uh, chin brow vertical angle is another one. So um, I don't think that you need to measure every single one of these when you're um, examining a patient, but I do think that uh, some can be pretty important. Um, you know, one of the, uh, I think, very useful tools is looking at T1 slope. And I think that the main reason I found it useful is because it, it tells you more about the entire spine um, as opposed to just the cervical spine. So uh, when we look at T1 slope uh, versus uh, cervical lordosis, you want those things to generally match in order to give a kind of a good balance to the overall alignment. But you can look, these are uh, three, um, three examples of, you know, 16 degrees or 17 degrees of cervical lordosis minus T1 slope that are equivalent. And we can all see that some of these are, are very, you know, that's obviously coming from a thoracic deformity on the left and that patient is probably significantly more symptomatic. You've got a more neutral spine, and then someone who has very little uh, curvature of the spine that may be kyphotic in their cervical alignment, but because they have that very low T1 slope, uh, that kyphosis may be appropriate for them. And uh, just a study, um, where they looked at totally asymptomatic people with an EO scan, and you know, 34% 34, 34 of people in that study had kyphosis of the cervical spine and were totally asymptomatic, and that's probably because of the rest of their spinal alignment and the ability to compensate. So when you're looking at your patients, these are important things to con consider. Um, this was a study looking at um, you know, which patients were um, had poor outcomes versus good outcomes with a cervical uh, fusion, and this was just looking at multi-level ACDF, uh, mostly three and four level fusions. Um, and so I would highlight the, the 
uh, poor outcome versus good outcome is not a huge difference. The correction of the Cobb angle is only two degrees difference. Um, and then the change in SVA is only a few um, millimeters difference, which in the operating room, you may not be able to see that under fluoroscopy, but that little bit of improved correction uh, did seem to make a significant difference in terms of patient outcomes. And you know whether they're happy with surgery or not, taking the extra time to do that good cervical lordosis correction can be, go a long way in terms of clinical outcomes. Um, and this is out of uh, ISSG looking at uh, parameters for, you know, predicting the uh, occurrence of both radiographic and clinical outcomes that were poor. Um, if you look at this kind of laundry list of things, you can see that very few of these actually have to do with the cervical spine. Um, you know, and looking at the global SVA, you know, thoracic kyphosis. Um, I think if we don't take that kind of holistic approach to looking at the patient, um, we can maybe think that, oh, we didn't do a good job surgically in the cervical spine. But many of these things are just a general spine disease, as Jens was talking about earlier. Um, and if we think we're going to fix the general alignment of the entire spine with just a cervical surgery, um, we may want to look at going a little bit further down into the thoracic spine. Um, otherwise, you're just going to be kind of buying time until the patient's next surgery. Um, and this is just looking at uh, neck range of motion, um, you know, where they, they fuse the mean of three levels and uh, looking at the range of motion afterwards. And so generally we think that by fusing the spine, we are losing motion. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight this little area, um, looking at extension and lateral bending. You know, patients were actually gaining um, gaining range of motion because they're less painful. And so I think by doing an appropriate um, alignment, you know, and by fusing cervical segments that are degenerative and, you know, limiting people in terms of their symptoms, you can actually improve the range of motion despite the fact that you're taking away a motion segment, which it can be counterintuitive. So some of the, the techniques that I think are helpful are, you know, looking at, um, you know, anterior, posterior column. Um, you know, what do you use for your cervical deformity surgery to hold the head? Uh, GW, Tongs, and Mayfield um, kind of trained with both of them and have used those um, interchangeably depending on what the pathology is. Uh, and say rotisserie, you know, some patients may not be able to be um, treated well with just a front back surgery. You may have to return to the front or return to the back. And in those uh, patients with extensive pathology, I think uh, these are important. And then looking at ACDF or corpectomy, all very valuable tools in uh, individual situations. So I think posterior only is, is very viable. Um, you can correct cervical deformity with just a posterior fusion. Um, I really like to look at those flexion extension views to see if they are correctable dynamically. And I think that you can get a lot of those even if someone is in neutral um, alignment in their neutral standing films, if they are able to correct on extension, um, that tells me that I can get more correction from a posterior only approach. Um, you know, use of that instrumentation, very strong C2 screws. Uh, these are pedicle screws that may give you more for fixation. If you're just using a PARS type of screw, I think you're at risk for pullout if you are trying to rely on your posterior only instrumentation for um, that cervical correction. Um, anterior column restoration, obviously um, very important in fixed deformities. So if you find that someone has a fixed kyphosis and flexion extension, I would you know, recommend doing that anterior column work. Uh, whether that's a multi-level ACDF, I, I really like that technique in preserving the normal anatomy. Um, focusing on the soft tissue releases. So releasing the uncovertebral joints anteriorly, removing osteophytes, um, you know, before you've even done any uh, discectomy can really start the ball rolling in terms of getting that overall correction. And then if you have vertebral body collapse, you know, a, a corpectomy is a, a very powerful tool in terms of um, if you have either just a very collapsed vertebra from years of arthritis or tumor and infection, you know, you're not going to be able to achieve that lordosis unless you give restoration to that anterior column. So just uh, um, looking at this 
um, actually learned this from our uh, arthroplasty technique using a narrow lamina spreader to really elevate that disc space. Um, if we're looking at using cast bar pins alone, um, you can have cut out of the bone and really uh, lose the amount of fixation you're able to gain. Um, so I, I like to use a, a narrow lamina spreader in that disc space, use that for elevation of that uh, cervical height and lordosis, and then you can hold that in position with the cast bar pins. And that's something that you know allows you to do more and uh, preserve the anatomy. And as soon as you lose fixation of your cast bar pins, you're losing the actual elevation that you're able to gain. Um, also looking at you know getting that very robust posterior lateral resection of the bone. So uncovertebral joints on both sides. This is looking at the very posterior aspect of the vertebral body. If we're looking at doing a reconstruction um, at each level, you know, making sure that you're getting that osteophyte resection and then placing your anterior, whether it's a cage or a bone graft there, that's already going to be giving you lordosis. And then if you come back and do a posterior, it's going to allow you to get that much more correction. Um, and then, you know, uh, looking at that kind of anterior posterior surgery, some people with very severe fixed kyphosis, you may need to come in and do your anterior corpectomy alone, uh, turn the patient over, do a posterior release. You can maybe stabilize them with posterior instrumentation. And then you want to come back and really support that anterior column with an, of the corpectomy in a, in a plate placement. So um, again, in their various approaches, front, back, front, back, front, back, you know, whichever way you want to do it, you know, just knowing that it may take more than just one stage in either the posterior or anterior to actually getting the correction you need. Um, and you know, being willing to do that rather than having to you know, do a secondary surgery because you're not happy with the results the first time, I think it's, it's much more effective to do it in, in one surgical setting. Um, I think intraoperative positioning is another one that I've found to be a very powerful uh, tool. Um, this is a Gardner Wells Tong setup with a dual uh, vector traction. Um, so, for those of you that's kind of hard to see, I just put in a couple arrows here. You know, you can uh, start your surgery, you know, you have your uh, single vector, which is pretty much in line with the spine holding direct traction. Um, after you've done your facetectomy and your posterior laminectomy, I like to do my instrumentation first, then do my decompression, making sure you do a very um, you know, full facetectomy. You've really created a lot of flexibility in the spine. And then you can actually switch the weight to the opposite vector, and that will pull the head into uh, much more lordotic anatomic position. Um, this is something that I think is important. You know, when we're working with fellows, um, you know, we may be able to scrub out, but if you have less help, this is something that the anesthesiologist can do fairly easily, um, and you don't have to be scrubbing in and out for. Same can be done with the Mayfield, um, you know, but that does require getting, you know, one, either the fellow or the attending to scrub out. Um, I think this is very powerful in the same way that we do our um, releases first, and then you can actually scrub out and lift the patient's head up into a better position. Um, you know, if you do want to get a lot more, I think the bivalent traction um, is an easier technique. Um, this can be much more powerful, but again, it, it's, it's more work in the surgery. And um, you know you, you have to make sure that you trust the person who's working with you either to make the movement of the head or to know that you've gotten enough movement looking into the surgical field. Uh, but again, another powerful technique that when you put those posterior rods in and lock everything into place, you've gotten as much correction as you, as you would like. So um, again, I think that uh, cervical lordosis is a very important piece of uh, you know, uh, deformity surgery, um, I think it's often overlooked. And, you know, even if you're only doing a two or three level ACDF, uh, those are things that, you know, you may be creating deformity. I know we talk about that often, but it's not always appreciated outside of these forums. And then uh, looking at your global alignment when you're approaching cervical deformity surgery is very important um, because you, it may take more than just addressing the acute um, deformity of the cervical spine. You know, you have to think about the support further down in the thoracic spine where that's going to end up and uh, you know really working towards having an ideal radiographic plan and uh, doing the best you can using all the resources available to uh, get to that point so 
that's it for my talk. Thank you guys, and uh, honored to have uh, any questions. Nicely done. So, uh, you know, um, I think this is lagged a bit behind lumbar lordosis, right? I think when I, when I finished my training 25 years ago, really we weren't as aware of the importance of lumbar lordosis, and gradually that has, I think, sunk in. Um, and now we're at a stage where the same thing's true for cervical. Um, I don't think we yet have the kind of uh, predictive um, models that uh, we do in lumbar spine. Were you able to find anything that sort of suggests we're headed in that direction? of how much we need uh, on an individual basis. Yeah, I, I think that that slide that I had up earlier where, you know, there, there just aren't the predictive tools in saying, okay, if I get to this number, um, then I, I've got my patient in a good position and they're going to do well. Um, you know, I think looking at the more global alignment is important. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, as part of ISSG, you know, that study, you know, the predictors for poor outcomes uh, very few of them are actually related to the cervical spine. So um, I think that it's it's really something that we have to look more at the, the spine as a whole. And I don't know that I have been able to see something that I, I feel like I can hang my hat on as the one thing. It's more of a gestalt at this point, and unfortunately that's, it's harder to, to learn and teach that. Right. I'm also interested, I'm sorry, I don't mean to. Yeah, Does somebody else have a question? Yeah. yeah go ahead. So, uh, so, you know, there's frequently patients that have a thoracolumbar deformity and a cervical deformity. Do you have a way to figure out which one to fix first <laughs> and why? So, I, I the, one, the approach I use is, uh, you know, which is more symptomatic, but but I definitely feel like the thoracolumbar deformity, you know, that's the foundation on which you're building the spine. Um, and if, you know, if all else is equal, um, I do feel like that that is the more powerful base which to build on because if you fix the cervical spine and the patient is badly kyphotic, um, you're really going to be setting them out for distal junctional kyphosis and failure. Um, so that's, that's usually the way I would want to approach it. Cheers. Hi, my name is uh, Eric. I'm a current fellow at University of Washington. Uh, this is more of a biomechanics uh, question, so a little bit, but I think it applies for um, cervical spine deformity. In, in my residency, most of the anterior cervical plates that we place were more of a uh, um, place in the tension band mode that the screws, both proximally and distally, were were um, locked sort of statically. But I know there are some cervical plates where uh, providers will put the screws in as a fixed angle screw at the caudal end, and uh, the cranial screws have some sort of uh, settling ability and the thought is maybe that uh, that shares more of a load to the inner body construct and and benzel has a good book uh, that i've been reading called uh, biomechanics of uh, spine surgery um so I, and and it, it's it's mentioned in vicaro's uh tips and tricks book well of, of sort of the different ways the anterior cervical plate can be utilized and i just was Curious, um, your thoughts on on the uh, cervical spine sort of locking plates and 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 the cranial screws, either putting them at a fixed angle to make it a tension band device, or sort of allowing those cranial screws to settle to get more compression or bony healing through your graft. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and um, you know, I think they're kind of two competing goals. Um, you know, if we allow a little bit of toggle in the plate, um, it is going to give more compression. You know, less stress shielding of those intermediate grafts, and I think that's probably better for healing. Um, if we have too much of that, I think we put ourselves at risk for subsidence and then losing the, uh, you know, the, the work that you put in to try to get that foramenal height and the decompression. Um, I think, 
very, I, I, you know, use a system where although the screws are called fixed angle, they're not truly fixed angle screws in the way that the screw may lock into the plate and create a very rigid, you know, it's kind of relatively fixed angle to the variable angle screw, which is going to allow a few more degrees, but neither one of those is truly fixed angle. So um, I think, uh, you know, those, those two things kind of work against each other. Um, and, you know, I don't know which one is truly more important. Um, if you're doing a shorter construct, obviously we're less worried about those rates of non-union. So you may want to go more towards a fixed angle construct if you're doing a longer, um, you know, there, there are arguments for, you know, doing an individual plate at each level. Uh, for the specific reason that you're describing, that you know, it allows for less stress shielding and uh, better rates of union, um, although it is a lot more instrumentation.